how long ago it was, but he has huge experience in this sphere, and I can think of nobody better to hand over to to chair this panel. And what I should also say is he's a fellow member of the board of EU Disinfo with me, for which I'm, I'm really grateful uh, to have his insight uh, into our doings. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Dana. We really appreciate it. It's great to see the dedicated crowd. Um, this is, you know, we only have 45 minutes. And uh, for, <laughs> congratulations to all of you for uh, being here for the very last panel. Um, uh, before I introduce the panelists here, I wanted to provide a little bit of an introduction. Um, and that is, it was about 30 years ago that the internet browser was created. Uh, a guy named Mark Andreessen, a uh, college student in Wisconsin, created the internet browser. And the internet had been around for a couple of decades prior to that. But it was more of an esoteric communication system between some researchers and, and the universities and the government. Um, uh, but then the, but the introduction of the browser turned the internet into something quite dramatic. It made it commercial. Um, it turned it into a communication system that would transform our economies and transform the world, frankly. Um, and now, um, the, uh, today, and we've had two, uh, two days now of hearing a lot of very interesting presentations, um, many of them and very enlightening in terms of defining and identifying many of the ills uh, that we see in the internet. Back when um, I met Diana for the first time, I was sent over here to represent the United States as the European Parliament was working on some of the first early digital legislation. And I remember at the time, and I think Diana and I were on the same page, we were, we were preaching the gospel of deregulation. We were talking about how the internet was gonna do these dramatically great things, how healthcare was gonna be improved, and our kids gonna be better educated, there'd be great business opportunities, and clearly, over the past couple of decades, that's happened. You know, we've created, uh, you know, this environment has created some of the largest, most powerful companies that we've ever seen in the globe. Um, but I never imagined when I first met Diana, I'd be back here in Brussels at a conference focused on what are all the ills that are happening and how do we address these challenges. And this is part of the creature that was created by laws and regulations established a couple of decades ago. And that's the reality of which we are now living with and trying to address that. Um, and so, uh, you know, here we are today um, uh, trying to look at this. So like I said, we spent two days looking at what the problem is now, trying to identify that problem. There's been a number of very interesting proposals and ideas about various tools to try to address that problem. The point of this panel, however, is to try to look around the corner a little bit and where are we headed? You know, how is the internet or the use of the internet being transformed? And what is it morphing into? How are the actors um, that want to use misinformation and, and weaponize, weaponize information uh, using this tool? And as has been said many times in this conference, um, the use of lies, weaponization of information, trying to uh, exploit people, trying to divide people, try to disrupt um, political activity is not new. It's been around for centuries. What is new is we live in a time where there's an accelerant available to these bad actors that's never before been seen in history. And that's what our challenge is. And so um, what I wanna do to, uh, is we're just gonna have a conversation here. First, I wanna introduce uh, uh, Ignat Trillig. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I'm German, I should know that, and I should know how to pronounce that. But Inga is, is uh, a, a um, research fellow at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, she has done a lot of work on radicalization. Um, you've done some very interesting articles that I've had a chance to read, where you've talked about the uh, decentralization of, of the internet, or as you phrase it, the re-decentralization of the internet, and some people refer to it as the D-Web or the Web3. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the work you're doing in terms of how the study you do on radicalization is being, and, and how these efforts are utilizing these new tools and using the internet in a new way, as well as the work you've been doing on encrypted app, apps and how that's now playing. So what are you seeing in this whole space with that? Um, yeah, okay, thank you so much. I just uh, checked the slide as well that is announcing us, and I, I mean, I'm proud I made it through my PhD, so I'm <laughs> happy about my title, but I'm actually really sure I'm not the only one with a doctor or PhD on the panel, so um, just clarifying that. Um, okay, start with, so one thing that really 
was very obvious for me the last one and a half days is that this panel is called the Internet of Tomorrow, but we've touched upon many things already, like Metaverse came up, um, the role of uh, encrypted messaging apps came up, um, deepfakes came up, etc. So the research, two research projects, big ones I've been involved in, I'd like to highlight a bit because I feel like they're not discussed enough and that's where we see a lot of action happening and um, they have like relevant implication about what's going on. Uh, one of them is the role of encrypted messaging apps for um, propaganda, for dis and misinformation. I'm using all of these terms, like I'm part of the propaganda research lab at UT Austin, and we define propaganda as like ways to influence public opinion, actually manipulate public opinion, right? And encrypted messaging apps has become one of our main research folk like focus because that is where a lot of uh, political propaganda spreads and we argue that it's more harmful if it comes to you via WhatsApp or via even Telegram, Viber, Signal, what have you. And the reason it is more harmful is because people usually don't expect it there. Uh, people trust the information on those apps more easily like than on other open social media platforms. And uh, then we have the added dynamic that it's much more difficult to counter or even flag a suspicious or something like that. Um, and I can go into more details because we started as like comparative international work and then by realizing how important um, those apps are, for instance, in the Philippines or in Libya and stuff for pro or Egypt for propaganda, we then actually realized, wait, they're also really important in the US, just not for everyone. They're super important for some communities and those are usually communities with um, migration, like migration background, diaspora communities, immigrant communities, what you want to call them. Um, that work focuses mostly on the midterm, so it's very topical. <laughs> um, and then the other thing you mentioned is the decentralized web. And I think there are other panelists who have stuff to add here, but that's a project I did with a collaborator, Laurent Bodo, um, as part of the Global Network of Extremism and Technology. That's like the research arm of GIFCT, if that is familiar to people here. And we just came across a bunch of people telling us that the DWAP is being exploited by extremists and that like that is the, the next big horror story and there are all of these terrible actors who are using it and no one can take it down and we do actually need Facebook to enforce takedowns and stuff because um, at least there we have an authority. And uh, Laurent and I started with <laughs> looking ourselves into what the DWEB actually is, and then basically doing an analysis of a bunch of content that was taken down related to Islamic State and Islamic State supporters, and then a bunch of content, I think it was almost 300,000 URLs just related to right-wing, similar amount almost to Islamic State. And then uh, first using Python and then using qualitative analysis, long story short, checking how many of those URLs actually lead to DWAP either file hosting and sharing services or DWAP social media platforms. And it was a very marginal amount. It was 4% for right-wing extremists and it was 14% for Islamic State. This discrepancy I would explain by the fact that Islamic State is more pushed towards um, exploring alternatives than a lot of right-wing extremists are because they are still very uh, successful in operating on open social media platforms. So yeah, there's, there was some good news and bad news in that study. Like we didn't find a lot of exploitation, but we're also saying in our risk assessment that it is on the radar and there's a constant need to adapt for malevolent actors online. And the DWAP raises like immediate red flags, I think for people here in the room who work on, on trust and safety issues, mostly disinformation online, because yeah, content removal is just a different story. Like it's it's supposed to give agency back to the users, which is good if you're a good user, if that makes sense. 
Great, thank you. Um, next, I want to introduce Sam uh, Gregory, who's with Witness, which Witness is a uh, civil rights organization that helps people utilize video and technology uh, in the promotion of civil rights. And um, Sam, you've written some interesting articles, um, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about some of the concepts you've used in your articles, particularly your authenticity uh, uh, infrastructure. And um, one of the things that jumped out to me when I read some of your work was you seem to be proposing some um, technological solutions to address some of these issues that would take away some of the subjectivity involved in terms of identifying and looking at content that's been altered um, and manipulated. And so please talk about some of your work there. Uh, thank you, Gregory, and uh, just a little note to everyone who's in the audience, these chairs are incredibly comfortable, and I feel very lucky to be up here at 3.45, so just my apologies, it's very comfortable up here. Um, so, so thank you for that introduction. Um, as Gregory noted, I work for Witness, we're a global human rights network uh, that is somewhat unusual in that our work is deeply grounded in the everyday realities of people who are trying to create trustworthy information. And I do come from that standpoint first, which is that there are lots of people trying to share trustworthy information about highly important public interest events and combat falsehoods. And then we also work at the infrastructure level trying to engage with emerging challenges to the ability of many people to create trustworthy information and to challenge falsehoods. And we're, we're very centered on vulnerable communities that are trying to share high public interest information like information about human rights violations. So that's where I come from, and, and that's what led us into the work that I'm gonna, I, I think, primarily talk about today, which is um, really trying to, as we describe it, prepare, don't panic around changes in the ability to synthesize and manipulate audio, video, text, a mix of those, what we typically think of as synthetic media. Um, and about five years ago, we started the process, which is guides how we do advocacy on solutions like the authenticity infrastructure you mentioned, but also on a whole range of issues by doing convening work with fact checkers and verification experts and technologists globally, as well as in the EU and the US. So what did people who were in the middle of this, who had never heard of deep fakes, but frankly have experienced gender-based violence, deceptive falsehoods, claims of corruption, all of these things, what did they identify as threats in this very abstract concept that you'd be able to manipulate reality and what did they want as solutions. Um, and I, and I want to reiterate the sort of prepare, don't panic frame, which we've used, which is I think uh, one of the, our lessons learned in this area is don't play into the hype because it's directly used to undermine uh, credible information when we talk about truth. Do lean into the existing threats that are already manifest. And, uh, uh, one of those that Luciana raised earlier, of course, is non-consensual sexual images directed primarily towards women and LGBTQ identifying people globally. So how do we make sure that we foster a discussion that recognizes we are moving to an internet of tomorrow that is much more easy to create mixed reality synthetic media? And that's the counterpoint to the hype cycle is to say, it's getting easier to do this. It will get easier, more efficient, faster, more available. Right, so it may not be easy right now to do the, the face swap deep fake, like that kind of classic thing. It's getting easier to make an avatar speak. It's getting easier to do fake audio. It's getting easier to do text generation. It's getting easier, as we've seen in the hype cycle of the last six weeks, to turn text to images, to create an image out of whole cloth. So um, let's start with just living with that balance, right? That we should combat the hype that says we're surrounded by deep fakes and we can all have our joke story like the Zelensky video, that was crazy, why did no one just laugh at that? But then you can also find stories that show very similar videos where people were um, deceived by very similar type things or found them destabilizing and you have to understand this technical change that's happening. So then that leads us to kind of what do we think about as solutions? Um, and I wanna say we need to think very thoughtfully about the mix of technical and societal solutions. So I'll just give like maybe a top line on those and then later in the conversation, hopefully we can come back to those. So on the technical side, um, we do see value in what's known as authenticity infrastructure. This is the idea that it is important that we show where media comes from, that we show how it's been edited, but we do that in a way that protects privacy, that is globally accessible and that is opt-in. Right, all of those are things we need to hold together at the same time as we say it's gonna to need to be easier to know how a piece of media was made. 
And we don't need to view that negatively, right? I think in the, whenever I'm in mis and disinfo spaces, labeling is that, oh, we got the bad thing, let's label it. But flip your mind a little bit and think about a TikTok video. A TikTok video is full of labels. It's labels about how it was made, who made it, how it was mixed, where it came from. We need to start thinking that the internet of tomorrow will have much more information about how media was made, and that is a positive thing. So there's a technical solution there for us to think about. Um, on the societal side, uh, really trying to, again, I actually think it is lean into a media literacy that is about understanding how media is made, playing into trends that already exists rather than trying to fight them. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there um, in terms of an intro and glad to go into those solution areas, how they relate to reg regulation, company efforts like the C2PA, uh, and other areas that people talk about in deepfakes like detection, um, and the inequities in access to that. I, one of the things I want to point to is this is an incredibly well-equipped room. You may think you are poorly equipped to deal with this problem, but when you work with journalists in Myanmar, community activists in Brazil, and you look at their access to solutions, their access to regulatory approaches, there is a market disparity that is only getting worse, for example, in the space around these emerging forms of manipulation. Great, thank you. Um, next, uh, Tricia Mayer, you are is an assistant professor at the Free University in, of Brussels. Um, so you get to be the critic. Um, you sent me a nice email this morning uh, with some of your thoughts, uh, which I thought were very insightful. So um, maybe you could speak for a little bit about um, the discussion we've had for the last two days here, the, you know, the challenges everybody's been talking about with the, the internet as we currently know it, the platforms as we currently know it, and some of the solutions people are looking at. Um, what are we missing? And looking around, looking ahead, and what, do you, what you know, kind of what are the threats looking ahead, and what do you think is missing from, um, you know, very intelligent, insightful people we've had here at this conference? But uh, you know, what do you think has not been talked about? Thanks. Um, I, I, some of the points that I'd like to make are are fairly obvious um, uh, if you've been around for the past two days or if you work in this field. But um, if we're thinking of the internet of tomorrow. It's obvious that the things that we're doing today are challenging already, right? Um, and that's looking a little bit around the corner at deep fakes or synthetic media and looking then further beyond, um, even though it's marginal now where people are, how it, these spaces are being used. Um, they'll be there faster than regulators are, for sure. Um, so I, I really liked the analogy yesterday that Hannah made of, of the digital natives versus the digital immigrants and, and regulators often being digital tourists uh, um, in these spaces. We're, we're not even there yet. We haven't uh, gotten on that train often. Um, and we are often not in the spaces where some of the the solutions that currently are present um, often aren't where uh, disinformation is, is taking place. We still very often are looking at text-based uh, uh, solutions um, and not considering how do we, how do we um, actually tackle disinformation that is present um, in these deep fakes or simply in videos um, and, and do this at a scale that is actually sustainable. So if we're thinking of gaps that are present, um, then, then I, I, I see kind of three main pillars of where disinfor disinformation responses are present. And, and one is uh, responsibilizing tech uh, the other is uh, throwing a lot of fact checks out there. Um, and the third is, is the media literacy component. Um, um, and, and all of those are necessary and more, right? I think we, we, we recognize that. Um, but what I'd like to point at is uh, what has also been uh, very often said here is that disinformation is often a manifestation of distrust. Uh, distrust in political institutions and mainstream media um, and that can be very easily peddled by those who see, uh, seek either financial or political profit out of that. Um, and there's the role of tech uh, companies to, to, to take into account there as well, and the mechanisms, the technological affordances that are present. Um, but I think that first part 
is where where we're really missing um, and and what we're not addressing is understanding this as a societal phenomenon that's not going to go away and that you're not going to solve by uh, throwing a fact check at someone or um, telling people, you know what, you have to be careful about your sources and read a little bit more, um, but really tackling those underlying uh, uh, sources of distrust, and that's something that has been going on for much longer than COVID, um, um, much longer than uh, Russia and China uh, throwing propaganda uh, on massive scale uh, online. Um, so that's where my research comes in, in understanding the, the components of this being um, a voice um, that we need to listen to and, and not simply discredit, but actually engage. Um, and so the second component, the flip side of that, is that I often think that we are looking at those who believe in disinformation um, as being very passive, as being dumb. Um, and there is a component of overload, right? In that we, I know all of the research on, on cognitive components that we're, we're also uh, quite easily misled, but there is an important aspect here that I think we're missing, which is also relevant to think of any of these solutions for the internet of tomorrow to bring this back and full circle is um, we, we're not gonna be able to solve this through tech. We're not gonna be able to solve this by uh, simply uh, having awareness campaigns. I'll stop there for now. Yeah, very good. yeah, sure. Just like a two finger on that because um, I, I very much agree and the research that we've been doing on those like minority communities in the US like to be honest they have good reason to have distrust in uh, like top down and authoritative sources so there there is still like a mainstream opinion out there that says okay I mean, I think fact checking is important and there's a lot that tech companies should do in terms of flagging or asking people if they really want to retweet and etc but when it comes to encrypted messaging apps which people see as private spaces and minority communities in the US you have a double dynamic where they want to create a private space for the community they basically create them in I'm going to use a theoretical term now from Nancy Fraser, who's a really great communication scholar, which is called a subalter counter public. And that can be a protective space as well. And the one thing you don't want in there is a, a tech company or a blowmaker or even someone from CNN, to be honest, telling you, wait, 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 no, this is not good. So yeah, like we've been battling with this because encryption adds another layer of complexity to countering disinformation. Yeah. Great. Um, anybody have any questions? All right, I have one uh, for you, Sam. Um, I'll, I'll get you soon. Um, let's return to your idea about um, uh, you know authenticity of, of looking at where videos came in. There's a lot of discussion about deep fake. So do you foresee in the future that um, there could be a technological solution that could serve as almost like a filter um, that could be on platforms that when somebody posts a video that's been clearly altered that there's a, we'd have the technical ability of going back and did identifying oh yeah this thing's been altered and I could immediately create a tool at least that that a platform could utilize to say you know you're looking at a video that's been that's been altered and it's could be like serve as a, as a, as a filter that's very that's just automatic is that possible um, I think that would be Technically challenging and probably actually I would not encourage I actually don't want to have something like that I think is probably where I would start I think there's a couple of things and these are things we heard around this and I should be clear sort of the movement towards authenticity and provenance infrastructure is a place where you see companies like Adobe and Microsoft and media entities like the BBC uh, involved and Witness was part of something called the C2PA, the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. And the place we came at it actually was leading the Threats and Harms Task Force. So really trying to poke holes in the idea of we should be able to understand where media comes from because you have to start thinking, well, what are the implications of this if it gets, for example, imposed at a platform level you know who will it who will it advantage who will it disadvantage whose privacy will it compromise how might it be weaponized in legislation so with all that said i think there is value in giving people these signals uh, i think what you're doing though is you're leaning in again and i think this is going to kind of 
not trying to sort of make this another act of fact checking or another act of kind of telling you yes, no, is simply trying to make it much more transparent how media is made, which is primarily creative when people use synthetic media filters, right? It's, you know, and, and, and I want to be careful about when I say primarily, and I'm very familiar with the statistic on non-consensual sexual images, right? So malicious deep fakes are primarily non-consensual sexual images, but there are many uses of synthetic media, like whenever you use a filter on a social media app, you're essentially doing this, and most of those are non-malicious. So 95% of deep fake technologies right now are non-malicious. So when you go to a platform, you might want to see that. And in fact, we might want to encourage that idea of how you lean into understanding the effects, you work out how to do it. And we'd want the platform to do it. The challenge is, of course, when you do it before or after. So the flip side of this is to say, it's probably at this point unlikely that we can expect that platforms detect manipulation reliably if they don't have signals beforehand. Right? And I say that because detection, deep fake detection, is not reliable. It's not easy to show people the exact manipulation. And anyway, if we start to think about synthetic media, and again, looking at something like text to image, which is the latest sort of trend, you know, that's things like in painting and out painting, right? You add something in an image, you change, you add stuff around it. It starts to get very complicated once you've got 10 of those effects on an image. What exactly are you telling people if you say it's a yes, no? So it's not a binary. It's an informative one, and, and to the perspective we have, we should do it by leaning into the creativity that will then have advantages when we think about the ability to think about how that helps people make decisions about untrustworthy or trustworthy information and how they evaluate information as individuals and communities. Great. Uh, a gentleman down there had a question? So my name is Julius Ender from DW Academy. We are doing media development projects worldwide in 50 countries. So, and, and following these two days, and I want to connect what Sam said, I see this form of new splinter net. So we have the authoritarian internet in some parts of the world. Then we have uh, our kind of protected internet. Um, and then we have, sorry to say that, uh, uh, Greg, we have the Wild West internet. So, and, and how, how and we haven't discussed it uh, uh, during the last two days. I haven't heard any ideas about it. So what, what could we do or what, what are your ideas um, yeah, to, to, to yeah, make the, the Wild West also make a little bit more uh, uh, of a safe internet? I think it was directed at, at Sam firstly. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but I'm just I'm just going to also say something because um, like d d I think our discussions so far have been really centered on on the West, like on Europe, US, etc., where we assume that governments are actually good actors. But uh, obviously, if you do international research, then that like whittles down really quickly. And um, and now now I forgot what your question was, but I knew it was a, a really good point about basically having different types of internet. And the one thing that came to mind for me immediately as well is also the, the case of Iran, for instance. So they've been so much more successful in shutting down the internet with the recent protests and taking protests and taking down and making much harder for people to use VPN or Tor networks to access anything because they built over the last years their internal like infrastructure on which most of the state um, services etc operate so actually the country doesn't shut down anymore when the internet shuts down and um, just like uh, most of the, the civic space shuts down so these were my two cents yeah, I can also weigh in. I, I'm not sure what um, you were referring to as the Wild West, but it it, it, um, it, it reminds me of, of narratives that have been used a long time about the unregulated space of the, of the internet and where we used to be very uh, tech utopian, now seeing it a, a much more dystopian-like, or at least realizing how... Uh, how, how the technology, which is not neutral, but can be used um, for good and for bad uh, as well, and that we are shaping the technology while being shaped by it. Um, and in that, in that regard, it's often been a, a reason to regulate the, the narrative that's been used by policymakers is, it's a wild west, it's dangerous out there, we need to, we need to bring that in. And I have this sense that when we're thinking of the internet of tomorrow, we're, we're jumping into that same narrative and just picking it up and saying, um, 
in part because we're not quite sure what we're talking about, but in part as well that there is perhaps more awareness. I would indicate, and, 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 and just to emphasize that, that I, I, all of the components of what we're doing now and more, uh, and I would kind of highlight some of the things that Alexandre mentioned yesterday of needing to think of um, more the infrastructural layer um, and, and kind of bringing in those new actors each time, I think it's a similar approach. And I do think we're it's, we're in a very different situation than 30 years ago when the internet was popularizing, where there really was this libertarian um, uh, independence of cyberspace uh, thinking, uh, where we've shifted, um, even if you look at the level of the um, Internet Governance Forum and, and, and um, some of the things that are going on at UN level, they, they talk about the interdependence of cyberspace. Well, we're splintery at the same time. Um, so in that regard, I think we are a little bit better prepared. And I also think that we um, need to be thinking of, okay, how do we tackle what is already present and deal with those problems while anticipating for the future. And one important component that I hadn't mentioned uh, before is looking at technology affordance. Uh, recognizing that um, depending on the technology, depending on the platform, they're designed in different ways and needing to look at how that provides opportunity um, to tackle or that uh, provides opportunity to manipulate, to misuse, um, and having much more attention to that. Um, and I don't know if she's in the room, but I'd like to highlight the work that my colleague Nathalie Van Ramdong does on that of really looking at group settings as well. And that's where I think that those spaces where they are far more private, you can think of, okay, what are what are the group settings uh, that, that are present? How, what role do uh, those who have more of a leadership or an editorial role, depending on, on what platform you're talking about, they have different terms, how can we bring that in, right? Um, and, and think of, again, going from that passive to that active role uh, of users. Um, so that was a very roundabout way to bring in some of my points on a Wild West question. Thank you very much. You, <laughs> I'll, I'll try and connect a few of our buzzwords here because I think that's another layer. So I, I'm acutely conscious in, in the witness context of the authoritarian internet because the majority of people we work with exist in that. And I think the first observation is to be careful what we wish for in the EU and in the US because it will be emulated. So as I look at authenticity infrastructure as a solution, I am like, how will this be weaponized under a fake news law or in the infrastructure, right? So I just, as a warning to us sitting here in a room in the EU, which I know people are aware of, but these processes feel deeply opaque, deeply inaccessible. That's the first thing. And then I wanna just pull the two kind of buzzwords in our panel, Web3 and Metaverse, because I think those are ideologies of the internet that we need to be very attentive to what they prioritize. So I think with the Wild West, you were referring to Section 230 US, um, I suspect. But I would argue like Web3 and Metaverse have some of that, you know, a very different set of ideologies underpinning them, right? So Web3 is about a trust, a frictionless environment. It's about decentralization. I'm taking their buzzwords. It's about immutability. Well, we should ask very carefully, are those the values we care about? Is immutability important? Um, Yes, but it's very much at odds with hate speech and mis- and disinformation. Is what people are looking for trustlessness or just better, more trusted intermediaries, right? So I think as a community, we really need to engage head on and say, what are the parts we like in this ideology or not? And it's kind of, you know, going sort of cutting across our environment. The metaverse, again, I think the place where it sort of that comes at it for us is, it's a vision in which a lot of these synthetic media elements actually get fully realized, right? So a lot of the discussion in the metaverse world is this idea of avatars and seamless sort of encounters with virtual spaces where you see people and encounter people. That is absolutely rife with the next manifestation of how synthetic media can be used to deceive if we don't have better ways to understand how we essentially explain and show and, and, and manage that. So just, they, they feel very abstract, but they're full of ideology and they're also very closely connected even to our like little next wave that feels rather science fiction. Uh, so we need to think ahead to that as well. Yeah, good point. Before I turn to Alex for a question, uh, you want to make some comments? Um, on the yeah. yeah, so uh, actually uh, two, two comments to follow up. Um, I, I really agree with your assessment, and I also know it's popular to say, and I agree that actually the user is supposed to get back more agency. 
that's the core of what I would call is the de-web movement, the re-decentralization of the web and giving the user more agency. And it's been around for a while and few people have picked it up because guys, it's a lot of work. Like being on the decentralized web is a lot of work. And I know people who have had their own instances and run like with Mastodon their own, so, and then they gave up after a while because you actually need to put at least a bit of money into it. You definitely need to put effort into it. So we are relying on those notes on um, decentralization of the web 2.0 by all of those big companies because it's easy. And that's also kind of um, hampering the positive outlook I had after looking at terrorists um, exploiting the decentralized web. Terrorists in the end or extremists are, are also just people and they also want to have less work on their plate and they evaluate um, platforms depending on security, stability, usability and output audience reach usually and usability and audience reach is really low for like any sort of dweb services and this is where my bigger concerns actually come in with regard to the internet of tomorrow and especially disinformation what i think most folks here are interested in because the metaverse is what i'm afraid of because the metaverse is pushed by meta mostly but also other actors and I don't think it's as much of a choice for people to go there. And I don't think, and it's not, it's not as complicated to join the metaverse. So we, if we want this or not, I'm very sure the metaverse will be coming just because there's a lot of money behind it. So I think that's something we need to look into. Alex, you had a question? Hi, I'm Alex um, from Disinfolab. Um, I'm not an historian of the internet, um, but I think your, the, the two comments that you, Sam and Inga made was very interesting because I think users are lazy. So I think we have all this ideology of like, yes, you will create your own space, you will have your own metaverse and you will have your own rules. And then we can say like the users will have to do it because the users will be empowered and they will be so much better managers of these than big platforms. But I'm not sure actually that's gonna happen because as you said, Inga, it's like, it's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work to actually create your stuff, to manage it, if you invite people to enforce the policies that you need to have, etc. So the question is, really, do we need to worry in terms of regulation? Or because there will be laziness and there will be actually big players taking the umbrella role of setting this up for everybody, things could enter in the DSA or the, in the current regulation we have. I think that's the question that we should be prepared for, because maybe this is an issue that we can tackle with actual regulation, or do we need to actually think about another regulation um, on these kind of players? <laughs> I know you want to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just see how the DSA turns out. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, let's start there. Um, okay, so, so here we're, we're, we're constantly in this space where we recognize that the de facto regulators are actually the platforms, right? Um, and that we need to responsabilize, if not make them accountable. For, for certain issues, um, while thinking of um, spaces that are um, user-driven or user generate, with user-generated content, et cetera. Um, recognizing as well what an important role they play, and I'm going back to the kind of classic social media platforms, um, how, their, how their algorithms work and that they do have a very strong editorial role in that. Um, so can we deal with it with the current regulations? I don't know, um, but um, I, I do think we need to recognize, which we have already, that platforms or these tech companies are the ones who, in the end, um, are going to be enforcing. Um, and that's where I wasn't, I wasn't trying to indicate that we just have to push it in the shoes of the users and those um, engaging, but that we do need to be thinking more actively in our solutions as well and pushing platforms towards um, having spaces that aren't just a top down, this is what you're allowed to do, this is what you're not allowed to do, um, um, but really kind of fostering those environments where we are um, 
discussing more actively of the type of, and here I am kind of jumping back to the 90s and what are the norms and the values that we want to instill in places, but kind of bringing that discussion through um, more. Uh, we have that very much on AI, right? On AI, it's all about the ethics and the ethics supposed to be driving the policy that we're developing now. Why aren't we doing that when we're thinking of uh, these next? Well, let me ask you, is, is a DSA a step in the right direction then toward what you're talking about? How do you see DSA? Well, it's a step <laughs> that we've been waiting for for a long time, right? So, um, but it is, it, it's, you know, it's the first time since, you know, the 90s that uh, I, I congratulate the EU for doing this. I mean, they've tried to create a regulatory structure. It's not going to be easy. But I'm back in the Wild West in the U.S. where we have no regulatory structure for any of this. I'm in Texas. Oh. <laughs> That's even worse. <laughs> and they're armed in Texas. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so... Um, yeah. Uh, so I think we're about finished. I have one more question, if maybe quick answer. You can do it in a word, maybe a sentence. Um, starting with you, Sam, and working down. Um, if you had to define what's the greatest threat looking toward the future, what's the thing that worries you the most about all the stuff we've been talking about? What, looking ahead, what's the, one thing? I'm actually going to take it back to where I start from in my work, which is that we undermine a lot of very essential truths that are being shared by ordinary people in our quest to deal with misinformation and disinformation. And that might have technical causes like synthetic media, but we have to be extremely careful about how we, and at Witness we describe it, we actually need to fortify the truth. We need to help people be much more resilient and proactive in asserting confidence in their media, being able to share it uh, and get people to trust in it at the same time as we're combating malicious actions that are occurring. Same question for me. Um, uh, yeah, I have to return to the beginning as well of that. I think in dealing with disinformation, um, including then in these in these future spaces, we're, we're missing a large component of why people are actually engaging with it, which is a distrust issue, and that we're not actually tackling that very well. Um, I I'm afraid that people will stop caring because, in my opinion, we are kind of at a disinfo peak. We had the 2016 elections, then COVID, now Ukraine, and we are in a bubble here right now, and we all care. But looking, I don't know, at people, the population more broadly, I'm scared that we will hit like depolitization and polarization to the point where everyone literally wants to do anything else in the world but not think about where the information came from and what is behind it or something, yeah. So that's actually also an agenda for us, I guess. Sorry, in a negative note, but it's been a great conference anyway. So, uh, Diana, please. 